Thanks for having me. I know I'm the minority in the crowd, and uh, I want to thank uh, Jeff Marks, congratulate him for finishing a year as SAGE president. Um, today, the uh, discussion is going to be focused on the procedure itself, uh, the pros and cons of that pneumatic dilation is primary treatment, some tips to minimize the risk if you go down that pathway, and then just some data on pneumatic dilation and salvage therapy. Um, my conflicts of interest do not have anything to do with achalasia therapy. And I, this is a great topic. Everybody's interested. And hopefully this is the most boring slide I have. But as a gastroenterologist, token gastroenterologist, I want to stress that I think the majority of endoscopic reports and exams are not done well. And uh, I harp on my fellows time and time again about photo documentation. So in the lumen, I'd like you to talk about whether there's food or fluid present, estimate the diameter and the tortuosity, um, and really have a critical eye towards infection, not just stasis, but actually if somebody has yeast. I don't think everybody needs brushes and biopsies, but it's very helpful. I'll show you a case of Barrett's esophagus and pseudoachalasia so that your eye will be keen for that. In the LS, LES region, I think you can do a really fairly good job determining whether there is resistance there. Um, a lot of it means the patient has to be very comfortable. You have to be comfortable. You have to have a very light touch on the scope. But when you get down to that LES, um, if it relaxes well for you, that should be reassuring and not worry that it's not achalasia. Achalasia, lower esophageal sphincter does, does, re does relax. It just um, doesn't relax completely or it's not controlled with the peristalsis of the esophagus. So if it doesn't relax, then that's really whenever I want your antennas to go up. And if that LES region is long, four centimeters, then you have to start thinking about something else is going on in that area. Then obviously, we need a nice examination of the uh, gastric cavity and mucosal inspection and make sure there's no excuse not to get a manometry. Endoscopy can always deliver the manometry catheter. Um, if you're having problems doing that, then maybe hand it off to somebody else. So here's a Barrett's esophagus um, within a patient with achalasia, and you can see the lines there in the top left of the storyboard. Um, this is an elevated or nodular Barrett's, and on narrow band imaging, when you get right up to the squamocolumbar junction, you can see the asymmetry on the right wall there. It is looking very different than the left wall. And in Barrett's esophagus, there's a predilection to the right wall from 12 o'clock to 6 o'clock. Um, this is amenable to endoscopic resection. This is a duet kit. In the last picture in the storyboard in the top row, the mucosa was aspirated into the cap, a band was placed, and then what you're seeing on the bottom row, first picture, is the immediate appearance after two band ligation resections. So what you want to do is you want to at first go after the largest lesion, which is right above the lower esophageal sphincter, and the second resection should be into the gastric cardia. It's very important to make sure you get that distal edge resected. And what you're left with after it heals about three months later is a nice picture of an endoscopic exam in a patient that has achalasia. And then the last picture on the storyboard is after they had a laparoscopic heller myotomy. We do a lot of poems at our institution, but because of the mucosal planes being disrupted, it was felt that they'd be better off with a, with a surgical myotomy. Now, pseudoachalasia, remember that pseudoachalasia, you cannot tell the difference between pseudoachalasia on x-ray, um, manometry, and sometimes even endoscopy. This is a, a great case that had typical uh, frothy lumen, and in the GE junction, you can see the mucosal break in the top left. In the retroflex view, it looks a little fold, a uh, little full. Um, this was dilated with the 18 uh, millimeter balloon just to facilitate the examination because it really wouldn't relax. And on endoscopic ultrasound, you can see there the asymmetric tumor and the gastric cardia. Okay, everyone knows about the Eckert score, the time bearing swallow. We advertise these with our patients up front as a very good way of following their disease. Um, I understand there's a lot of problems with compliance and, you know, natural um, human behavior. It's, it's, you know, it's not rocket science, it's much harder. And because of that, if you um, tell them how limited you are in terms of your tools, the, the, the chronicity of the disease, and you build up the expectation you're gonna see them every year and do periodic testing, in our Barrett's population, our follow-up is over 90%. The barium swallow is better than the patient symptom score, you know that. 
Um, and there are some tricks to um, you know, predicting whether the symptoms would relate to the height or width. Okay, you're all experts in surgery, and you know the data better than I do that the randomized controlled trials um, showed that um, initially laparoscopic helminotomy seemed to be equivalent to pneumatic dilation in a graded fashion, and you can debate that all day. The latest consensus, with, which I think is a very fair review of both gastroenterologists and surgical input, 330 references say that there is strong recommendation that pneumatic dilation can be used, but there's a caveat, and patients wishing, wishing long-term remission may offer surgical treatment. I have no problem with that statement. The beauty of the randomized controlled trial is the data we gained after they were followed, and it's with that randomized controlled trial that it turned out that there's a lot of fallout. You know, there's no question that if you started out randomized pneumatic dilation, there's a 22% dropout rate. So just in surgical, um, in centers that have surgical expertise, a lot of people um, ended up falling out for various reasons. The protocol in the beginning had to be changed because the pneumatic balloon was too large and a lot of people suffered perforations. So it's, you know, pneumatic dilation has baggage. Now where I um, uh, trained and when I trained, we didn't really have the data on the subtypes. And you can't argue one versus another unless you've already randomized patients to the different subtypes. And that has not been done. The data on the subtypes came out about the same time as the randomized clinical trials. And then along comes POEM. So really going back and sorting this out is just not going to happen. These clinical trials were randomized based on age and center. So you had stratification in Germany and Italy and Belgium, but you didn't really have stratification for one, two, and three types. And what you do is, you know, you have to just deal with the data that you have, but clearly there's no, um, no strong argument to use pneumatic dilation in a type three patient. So for the procedure where I grew up in um, Cleveland, the, uh, we had at the, in the heyday, we had six or seven people doing pneumatic dilations, and there was probably four or five different protocols. Um, this is the protocol I adapted and I like. It has everything to do with how Ed Ashgar trained me, and it, and it would conflict with, say, Joel Richter. Um, I used 30 millimeter balloon always for the first session fluoroscopy as opposed to endoscopy, the fluoroscopy is going to allow you to control the guide wire, localize the balloon, and visualize that waste. Um, the way I was taught is that we only inflated the balloon once. We didn't really look at the pressure gauge. We went up until the balloon was effaced, put the balloon down, and left. And there's a lot of people that would say it has to be up for a certain period of time, has to be up for a certain pressure, and uh, you know, as a therapeutic endoscopist, Sometimes I'm okay with achieving a lot less than somebody else, but I like my track record being a little, little cleaner. Now, uh, larger balloons, 35, 40 millimeters, definitely have a, um, a use, uh, but that's only for patients that have insufficient relief, uh, other symptoms after the 30 millimeter balloon. And the repeated sessions range anywhere from one day to three weeks or four weeks, but I've seen some practices where Patients will come back after uh, two months. I don't think there's a real, real um, hurry to get this done. The uh, negative predictors being the young patient, the pretreatment chest pain, and those patients that had high lower esophageal sphincter pressures after the treatment and poor emptying on the time bearing swallow. The perforation risk, uh, you know, when I was training, the thoracic surgeons were tossing around perforation risks of 7%, and it turns out that. Um, it's probably dependent on the technique. The one outlier there that has a very large number of patients in the clinical trial um, all had a 35 millimeter balloon. And you know, based on the randomized control trial, we know that we should start at a 30 millimeter balloon. And with good, good hands and good technique, the perforation rate should be about 1% or less. And then if you compare those side effects to surgery, because surgery does have perforations, surgery does have surgical complications, Pneumatic dilation actually is a relatively safe procedure. It's not as safe as a colonoscopy or an EGD or a radio frequency ablation of Barrett's. I get all that, but you know we shouldn't be scaring our patients away from pneumatic dilation. Now, the follow-up, the latest follow-up that I can find was from this year, the largest meta-analysis of 20 studies, 1,500 patients. You can see 
pneumatic dilation does not rate compared to surgery across the board, and POEM seems to be in the lead. There is, there, I should say, there are bias to this data. Some of these series did not use graded uh, pneumatic dilations. Some of them did use graded dilations, but limited the number of dilations that can be performed. In a sense, that's not really fair. If you do a cost-effective cost approach as a healthcare provider, the pneumatic dilation is about $1,500. Poems and laparoscopic myotomies are about 10 times the amount. Um, again, if you do multiple dilations, that does add up and you start to come closer and closer together. Um, the education, I think, is, is key, and all of you probably have access to up-to-date. I think the um, up-to-date by, by Stuart Speckler on achalasia is a very fair um, piece of information that you can give directly to the patient. It explains, you know, the process. It talks about expectations. It reviews the complications. Um, the GERD uh, after pneumatic dilation was quoted as 2%, and I think what you could do is you could take that information and just scratch it out and say it's really around 15%. That shows you're engaged. It shows you con you're concerned, and uh, I don't think anybody really cares about, you know, whether um, they have to use some omeprazole after a treatment or not. I mean, that's there's so few patients out there that have this rare disease, we're not gonna figure that out. It's not like coronary disease where we can determine exactly what kind of stent needs to be done in a coronary artery. Okay, so the pneumatic dilation is done. Patient gets observed for four hours minimum. Um, the, by the guidelines, the only ones that get contrast study are the ones that have symptoms, but it, with any symptoms whatsoever. There are still some professors out there that do a um, contrast study on every patient. Um, esophageal stents and laparoscopic or thoroscopic repair are very um, useful. Uh, attentive care is the most important thing, and I'll show you some data from Belgium. The intravenous antibiotics, draining fluid collections, and new nutrition support are just key. So this is the Belgium series of 870 pneumatic dilations resulted in 16 perforations. None of them required surgery. One of them that died of metastinal bleed would never have, uh, apparently didn't survive surgery or wouldn't have survived surgery either way. You could see the graph on the bottom right, the outcome is excellent. This is another recent clinical experience where they looked at salvage after POEM, 441 patients. Um, you see the efficacy there after the redos. Uh, pneumatic dilation seemed to have an efficacy about 20%, a heller about 45%, redo POEM 63%. Very, very small numbers, confidence intervals, um, very wide. They're actually not even calculated in the, in the paper. Those are just my rough estimates. But you can see in third line therapy, pneumatic dilation is very rarely helpful. I know we do it and I, I don't think there's any problem with it. There's just not a lot of data for it. And then long-term management, um, compared to repeat myotic poem, poem uh, it's, it's probably the first option for a failed laparoscopic um, hiatal um, laparoscopic Heller myotomy, um, but they do, um, there, is, there is debate, and the consensus was only 80% in the last guidelines. And there's really insufficient evidence that any of the surgical myotomies um, or endoscopic myotomies are better than pneumatic dilation. That's where we really, really need further clinical research. And then the, a touch on the cancer risk, uh, the latest pub, pub paper out there was the English paper that had the largest number of patients um, and what's interesting there is the risk included older age, pneumatic dilation as opposed to surgical myotomy, and anybody that need reinterventions. So generally the ones that have stasis seem to be more risk for cancer. And moving this right along, because I know I'm over the time, I apologize, but uh, monitoring long-term symptoms, we tell them in advance the time-bearing swallows are helpful. They like to see the results. It's one of the things that uh, you can put it in front of them, show them the images, they partake in the... Um, in the uh, follow-up exam. And your goal really, from my perspective, is just to prevent the mega esophagus. Um, retention of fluids and strictures uh, result, or ineffective relaxation, you have to measure that with a manometry. Um, you've already covered the uh, peptic issue uh, quite well. And there's no recommendation on surveillance. What my, my rule of thumb is, all these patients should be seen at least once a year in the clinic, and then you can decide whether they should be treated or not. Uh, there's a tremendous amount of pressure on patients financially. All these procedures, including manometry and EGDs, are very expensive, and many times we don't put that in the forefront. If you put it in the forefront, 
a lot of times they'll offer up the reasons they didn't come back. Even the copay for your facility fee can be a barrier. So in conclusion, pneumatic dilation outcomes are highly variable. They're similar to laparoscopic hilarmotomy in type 1 and type 2 achalasia, but less effective than POEM in all subtypes. Pneumatic dilation should be avoided in type 3 achalasia and those with significant pretreatment chest pain. The perforation is high, starting out at a large balloon, 35 or 40, and pneumatic dilation is reasonable for patients that have prior myotomy. And monitor these patients for late treatment failures, see them in the clinic, repeat the upper endoscopy manometry and time variance follow when you, are, when you can. Um, the Council on the Risk of Malignancy, I think, will help bring them back. Thanks. Thank you.